This is a 1995 BMW 850 CSI, and it is the coolest BMW from the 1990s. And yes, I understand all the implications behind saying that, and I also understand that the Z8 came out in 2000. Today, I'm going to take you on a tour of the 850 CSI, and by the end of this video, I suspect you'll agree that you wouldn't want to own any 1990s BMW more than this one. Before I start my tour, I'm going to give you a brief overview of the 850 CSI. Now, the BMW 8 Series was sold in the United States from 1991 to 1997. It was the flagship coupe model. It was the two-door companion to the BMW 7 Series luxury sedan, much like the Mercedes CL was to the Mercedes S-Class, although the 8 Series was sportier. The base model in the 8 Series lineup was the 840i, later the 840ci, which used a V8 with about 300 horsepower. There was also the 850i, later the 850ci, which used a 5-liter V12 that also had about 300 horsepower, but it had a lot more torque. And then at the top of the lineup, there was this, the 850csi, the ultra-high-performance model, used a 5.6-liter V12 that later formed the basis of the engine that was in the famed McLaren F1. One. The 850 CSI had 375 horsepower, and every single 850 CSI had a six-speed manual transmission, making it one of the few modern-day stick-shift V12s. The 850 CSI is incredibly rare. BMW only made about 1,500 of these for the entire world, which makes this car about as rare as a Ferrari F40 or a Porsche Carrera GT. Of those 1,500, only 225 were imported to North America, and this is one of the 225. When this car was new, the original window sticker price back in 1995 was about $105,000, which translates to about $175,000 in today's money. And these things are becoming collectible. Values are on the rise, and really nice examples of these can sell for around $100,000. Today, I'm going to take you on a tour of the 850 CSI, and I'm going to show you the interesting quirks and the cool features of the most expensive BMW you could buy in the mid-1990s. Then I'm going to get this thing out on the road and see how it drives, and then I'm going to give it a Doug score. And for more of my thoughts on the 850 CSI, click the link below to go to autotrader.com slash oversteer, where I've also compiled a list of some other BMW models currently for sale on Autotrader that are sure to be valuable collectibles sometime soon. Right now, on to the quirks. I'm going to start by simply getting inside the 850 CSI. It has a normal door handle, just like most BMWs from this era, but the door handle says BMW Motorsport on it. That was unique to the 850 CSI. It's one of the few ways you can tell an 850 CSI from a regular 850 from the outside. Now, once you open the door, you're confronted with the door panel, which is a rather luxurious affair. It's also a rather heavy door, since this is a long coupe. A couple interesting things on the door panel. One of them is there's a little coin holder there right next to the window, so that when you pull up to a toll booth, you can just open the coin holder and stick the coins in the toll booth. That was typical German innovation from the time period. Maybe more interesting is the fact that there is an air vent on the door itself. That's unusual, but maybe even more unusual than that is the fact that there are controls for the the air vent on the door next to the vent itself. You can increase or decrease the flow using this little dial next to the vent. Now, the next thing you notice when you're getting into this car is the fact that the door sill says M on it, which is, of course, BMW's performance brand, except that this car isn't an M car. This is the 850 CSI and not the M8. Well, that's only sort of true. The door sill is factory. They came from the factory with the M door sill. And here's a little piece of car geek trivia for you. All BMW VINs, which BMW is built in Germany, start with WBA. All BMW M car VINs start with WBS. The VIN for this car, even though it's not an M8, starts with WBS. It is the only exception in all of BMW's history to that rule. It's the same story with the engine. Engines in BMW M cars and only BMW M cars have their internal engine code starting with S, presumably for sport. This car has an internal engine code that starts with S, which suggests that maybe they were intending to build this as an M car. The door sill, the VIN, the engine code, and yet, for some reason, they didn't. There's some debate about why that didn't happen, but this car wasn't called the M8. It was called the 850 CSI, despite all those markers traditionally associated with a BMW M car. 
and the M items inside this car go beyond the door sills and the VIN code and the engine. This car also has M stitching on the steering wheel in the M colors, and it has the M colors on the gear lever. And of course, I already showed you the BMW Motorsport door handles. There's a lot of theories about why this car wasn't actually an M car. Maybe it was too big for the M division. They never made an M7. But either way, this is sort of the half M, half regular BMW. But of course, the M touches aren't the only things you notice when you climb inside. One of the biggest things you notice the moment you open the door in this car is just how many buttons this thing had. In addition to being a stick shift V12 high performance car, this was also a tremendously expensive luxury car, and so it has everything. One of the first things you'll notice when you climb inside this car is that everything in this interior is basically turned towards the driver. Everything in the center controls, even the center climate vents are all turned towards the driver. This was a driver's car and this emphasized that point. Indeed, that meant all of the weird buttons and switches were turned towards the driver and I'm going to start with the headlight switch, which is one of the strangest headlight switches I've ever seen. It's not just this little circular dial you turn like in virtually every other car. Instead, it's this little dial that you move up and then it sort of circles the current position of the headlights. It's very strange. Interestingly, this car also uses that switch for the fog lights on the other side of the gauge cluster. Next, moving on to the steering wheel. I really think that the interesting thing about the steering wheel, though, is the fact that this is one of the early BMWs with airbags. And back then, BMW couldn't figure out how to fit an airbag and make their logo colored. So you have the BMW logo on the steering wheel, but it's just black. Also interesting about the steering wheel, the steering wheel in this car is power adjustable, which would have been a huge deal in 1995. It's still a pretty big deal today. And the memory settings were not only for the seat, but they also controlled the position of the steering wheel, which was very forward thinking. Then again, for a hundred plus thousand dollars, it better have been. Moving on to some other interesting items, starting with the radio head unit. This is from a later BMW, but I always like the fact that these BMW head units say on them, BMW business seat. CD for the for the business person who wants to play a CD. I don't know. I, I never really understood what that meant, but they all said it at that time period. Next up is the heated seat control. Of course, this car has heated seats. It's a luxury car and turning them on is interesting. You push this little switch next to the transmission lever and it lights up red with these little heating lines. Or if you want less heat, you push the switch down and you get only one little heating line. But I like how it lights up. Of course, there's a driver heated seat and a passenger heated Let's see. Another interesting item in the center control stack in this car. This car was made in the days before screens and especially before touch screens in the center, but it does give you the ability to check all sorts of different vehicle information like your fuel consumption, the outside temperature, your average speed, your fuel range. You just push these little buttons and those various things light up. But as you can see, a few pixels are burnt out because BMW used these pixel screens on all of their cars in the late 80s and throughout the 90s and there are pixels burned out of every single one of those screens today. I've always found this interesting. This was really a precursor to what later became iDrive and all the other infotainment systems that now tell you every piece of information you could possibly want to know. Also interesting in the middle are the climate controls, and specifically the climate control that lets you change the temperature. These were not that uncommon back in the 90s and the 80s in luxury cars, but they're very odd today. These little dials that you just rotate and it becomes less blue and then more red as you go from cool to hot. It's not a screen like in modern cars or little buttons that you press and just change the temperature. Another interesting item inside this car, put the sun visor down. It looks like a normal sun visor. Open up the mirror. It looks like a normal mirror, but above the sun visor and lighting the mirror are not one, but two lights. So you can look at yourself in amplified lighting. That's what you got when you paid the equivalent of $175,000 for a car back in 1995. Two visor mirror lights. And speaking of mirrors, we must now discuss one of the most bizarre interior quirks of this car, and that would be the switch on the interior mirror that turns on and off the dimmer. Now, I understand why you would want a switch to turn on and off the dimmer, but why is it this giant dial that you turn? All it has to do is turn from on to off. It can be the tiniest little switch, but instead it's this huge circle that actually takes away a little bit of your visibility when you're in the car. It's very bizarre. And then we move down into the middle of the center console where you will find the phone. Ah, yes, the phone, because you couldn't have a luxury car in this era 
and not have a phone. People who spent this kind of money on a vehicle needed to be reachable while they were driving. Of course, none of these phones still work today, which is a shame, but there's just no support for them. But I can just imagine a time when you're sitting in your 850 CSI. Hello? Yes, I'm going 150 on the Autobahn. I'll be in the office in five minutes. And then of course you would turn up your business CD. Next up, moving on to a couple of interesting items in the passenger side of the CSI, starting with the glove box. Now, if you look over here, you will see maybe one of the most intuitive glove box latches I've ever seen. There's an upper glove box and a lower glove box, and there's a keyhole that straddles them both. So when you turn the keyhole, you lock both glove boxes at once. It's a brilliant design, except by the time this car came out in 1995, it became very clear that luxury car buyers wanted dual airbags, so the upper glove box became an airbag. There's only a lower glove box in this car, but they kept the latch. So it looks like there's a latch to open the upper glove box, but there isn't. When you turn that lock, it only locks the lower glove box. So the lower glove box has a couple of very interesting features in it. My favorite is the cup holders. This car doesn't have cup holders anywhere else, but cup holders were also becoming common in luxury cars this time, so BMW added them to the glove box. They are the least sturdy cup holders in history, but you have two cup holders in this car. I just wouldn't ever put anything in them. Another item you'll find in the glove box of this car is a flashlight. Virtually all high-end German cars of this era had a flashlight in their glove box, including this one, and take a look at this thing. It actually works. So if you're on the side of the road, you're stranded, maybe you need to change a tire, you have at least a little bit of illumination from that flashlight. Of course, this was the days before cell phone flashlights. And speaking of the glove box and storage in this car, it's worth noting there is one sort of hidden storage compartment in the 850 CSI. It's on the door panel, and it's this leather storage that is below basically everything else on the door panel. You wouldn't really know it was there unless you're looking for it, but it's a nice place to put things if you're angry that BMW took away your second glove box. Next, we move on to the rear seats of the 850 CSI. Yes, this car has back seats. Even though this was a sporty stick shift V12, it was also a grand touring car. And so you were supposed to be able to put people in back and go on a grand tour. The interesting quirk about climbing into the back seats is that you can put the front seats forward like that, but there's no way to actually move them forward along the rails. Instead, the only way to do that is you push the power adjustment and then you wait and you wait and you wait until there is enough room for you to get in back, which, well, never really happens. Nonetheless, I will climb into the back seats as usual. Ugh. Ugh. All right, I made it. Not surprisingly, it is really tight back here. For one thing, the seats are sort of angled down, so when I just sit naturally, I, I fall back into the car which is kind of funny. The other interesting thing is that there is enough room for my hips, but when I put the driver's seat back, there's basically no room for my knees, which is really a problem because the front seat is all the way forward. It doesn't go any further forward. So a driver could sit in this car, but they'd have to be about three foot seven. Now, there are a couple of other interesting things in the back seat of this car, one of which is the fact that the rear seat seat belts come from the center. So when you get in this car, you don't go over your left shoulder to put on the seat belt. If you're sitting on the driver's side, go over your right shoulder because the seat belts come out of the middle. Another interesting item that comes out of the middle, there is a center armrest to add to your comfort sitting in the back seat. I'm sure it helps dramatically. Inside the center armrest, you will find this car's first aid kit. Now, I opened this first aid kit probably for the first time since it's been opened since this car was sold new more than 20 years ago, and I discovered some first aid supplies that are probably well past their expiration date, along with CPR guidelines from 1992. So, if you want to know how they were performing CPR 25 years ago, just climb in the back of an 8 series. Also interesting in the back of this car is the fact that there are no rear window switches. The back windows in this car do roll down, but the rear seat passengers can't roll them down. There's no way. Instead, if you were sitting back here, you simply had to ask the driver nicely to roll down the rear windows so you could breathe. Also interesting is the fact that the rear seats fold down. No, they don't fold down to allow you to put cargo in the trunk and have it go into the passenger compartment. Instead, they just fold down to reveal carpet instead of leather. I guess the theory was that you could put cargo here instead of people, which frankly is probably a more practical way to use the rear seats anyway. Next, I'm moving on to the exterior, and I want to start by talking about those rear windows. 
Take a look, all the windows are down in this car right now and it is just one giant open space. Virtually every other modern car has a pillar between the front and the rear window for structure and it's cheaper and easier to build it that way and obviously a lot more common, but this thing is really cool. BMW never did a convertible version of this car, but with the windows open, it feels like the interior is open to the world. I love it and I love how it looks with the windows down. Now, there are a couple of other interesting exterior quirks and features in this car. I'm gonna start with the mirrors, which are very unusual. They look like normal mirrors, especially when you're sitting inside the car, but from the outside, they look like they're upside down. They don't flow along the lines of the car at all. In fact, they sort of flow the opposite direction of the lines of the car. I don't know why BMW styled the mirrors to look like this, but this was the mirror on the 850 CSI. Next up, in the same general vicinity, another very interesting quirk. Now, it seems this was the first BMW designed entirely using CAD, and if you look closely on the windshield wiper, you can see there's a little scuff mark, and that is from the windshield wiper hitting the underside of the hood. The owner of this car is convinced that this was BMW's only CAD error in the otherwise beautiful design of this car. They screwed up the placement of that little area, and so every Every time the windshield wiper goes up to wipe the windshield, it scrapes a little bit on the hood. In fact, the owner tells me if you look at other 8 Series models, virtually any time you see one, you will also see a little scrape on the wiper in that area. And speaking of the hood, let's discuss the hood opening procedure, which in this car is rather unusual. Now, it starts in the normal way. There's a latch underneath the steering column, the driver's foot well, pull it, and the hood pops up. From there, things get strange. There isn't just one single latch under the hood that you pull, and then you can lift up the hood. Instead, there are two little tabs, individual tabs, one latch on either side, and you don't pull them, you push them in. You have to push them in at basically the same time, they unlatch, and then you can open up the hoods. Now, when the hood went up a second ago, you probably saw it maybe the most well-known design element of the 850 CSI, it's pop-up headlights, and I wouldn't want to deprive you of the experience of not seeing them in action, and so, here you go. To me, probably the most interesting quirk of the pop-up headlights is the fact that they aren't located at the corner of the hood. Most every other car with pop-up headlights placed them at the very corner of the hood, so the hood was designed to go around it, which would have been cheaper than what BMW did, which was stamp holes in every single hood to account for the pop-up headlights. But that's the situation in this car. Because the headlights have to be fixed by government regulation, they stay put when the hood is open, and so there are just these giant holes in the hood when it opens up. A couple of other interesting things under the hood of this car. Take a look at these hood hinges. They're just needlessly complicated. I don't really know what to say about them except for the fact that they look like way overkill, but it was the Germans and that was their thing. Another interesting thing under the hood, unlike every other car, this car has two reservoirs for the windshield washer fluid. One is for the regular washer fluid, the other is for intensive fluid. You pull the washer fluid lever on the steering column towards you for regular fluid or push it away if your windshield is especially dirty and requires a more serious solution, seriously. And then we move on to the trunk. There are a couple of interesting things in the trunk of this car, one of which is simply the way you open it. There's no obvious latch or even keyhole on the outside of the car. Instead, all of that stuff is tucked underneath the BMW logo above the license plate. When you open the trunk, you're rewarded with a surprisingly roomy and nicely carpeted cargo area befitting a grand touring car like the 8 Series. I also like this little tray underneath most BMW trunks. You open it up and it includes all of the tools so that you can just stand here and work on your tools. They're right at eye level and perfectly parallel. You can just open this thing up, you get out your tire iron, you get out your screwdriver, whatever you need to work on your 850 CSI at the roadside. Another cool feature about that tray, how about the cool graphic printed in the plastic showing an old 1980s 7 Series to demonstrate how to use the emergency warning triangle. Also interesting, in the trunk, the 8 Series has two batteries. You can see one here. It's required because it was so full of what was considered complicated electronics at the time. The other battery is on the other side of the trunk to distribute weight. They're connected in parallel, and this warning label reminds you of that since disconnecting them is more dangerous than a normal car battery. And so, those are the quirks and features of the 850 CSI, the flagship of the 8 Series line, the flagship of BMW in the 1990s. Now it's time to get it out on the road and find out how the 850 CSI drives. All right, driving the 850 CSI, a manual V12. That is a special thing. There's not too many of those. You know, it's funny, cars from this era just didn't sound like 
modern cars do. Modern cars, the exhaust note is such a huge component of why people buy cars. And the, the, these older cars, it was almost like they were trying to mute it to keep it like a luxury car, keep it subtle. All right, here we go. Wow. <laughs> Man, it really, it's shocking how quick this car is. And it's smooth power. This is like, this is, this car builds power like an old, you know, like an S600 or something. I mean, you know, when you drive a sports car, an S2000 is probably about as quick as this car. And when it gets to the seven, 8,000, 9,000 RPM, it's just shaking and you know, you know, you got upshift. This thing, I looked down when I was at Redline and I didn't even realize it, which is surprising. I love the fact <laughs> that I can rev match a downshift in a V12. That, that is the coolest feeling in the world. Um, because, you know, I drive some V12s, but I n never stick shifts. And when they are stick shifts, they're Ferraris with gated shifters, and you're nervous, and you're not really, and the gate makes it difficult. But this car, BMW shifters and, and transmissions and clutches are so easy to operate. The clutch is just butter smooth in this car, and going through gears is tremendously easy. I mean, it just, it feels like, honestly, it feels like I'm driving a 318, E3318i. It's just that simple until you floor it. The, the other thing that's really cool about this car is it's just, not only is it, everything is completely stock, but everything just is nice. Everything looks nice. This is how it was. I, I feel like I'm having the 1995 experience. Man, he just dropped the hammer and just go. I, and it's also, of course, tremendously comfortable. I mean, this seat is just this plush leather. It's, it's surprisingly soft leather, a soft seat cushion. I mean, I, this is the kind of car, it's fun to floor it and to feel the V12 pulling and the, it's to shift the gears. But I feel like I could just shift into sixth and just sit on the highway at 90 or at 100 all day long. You know, one of the things I really like about this car is it's a, it's a the look is just so nice. It's, it's a subtle look on the outside. There's no crazy big wing. There's, there's no way to know that this is like this ultra special V12. I mean, this was an era where if you wanted to make a special car, you could make it subtle and it would blend in. And, and the cool thing was having a sleeper that no one knew you were in a special car. One of the things I like about driving uh, German cars in this area, especially really nice ones like this, is everything just feels really solid. Driving here at normal street, normal speeds, behind a Hyundai going 20, the thing feels great. It feels very smooth. The ride is very smooth. Um, I suspect the, the result of that is it probably doesn't handle quite like a sports car. And, and this isn't one of those clutches where it's you get into traffic and you're like, oh, darn it. The clutch is pretty easy. It's easy to operate. It doesn't have one of those weird... Th I mean, it, 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 handled, it seems like it handles great, but I, I get the sense, just driving at 20 minutes as I am now, I get the sense this car was designed for high speed cruising, high speed passing. I mean, I could sit here and do this and drop my foot and go from 60 to 90 to get by someone. God, the downshift, rev match downshift. First off, it's easy. I know, I just feel like I've driven this car for hundreds of years, uh, even though I just got in it because it just makes it so easy. It's so easy to push the accelerator, does exactly what you'd expect. It revs very quickly, especially for V12, I'm surprised by that. Just the clutch and shift lever are so easy to operate. But there is some on-center vagueness, there's some body roll. Um, I'm surprised that the turn-in is just not, uh, it's just not as precise. I mean, that's just what it was though. I've never driven a car from this era where it was like, oh my God, it's so precise. That's, that's really a thing that's only happened in the last four or five years that they've really figured out how to eliminate all that vagueness associated with when you just start to turn. Man, pulls through that corner. This car is best on long straightaways, but also like wide, big sweeping turns. You can drop the hammer and just kind of push your way out of a corner and it feels, it feels great. So that's the 1995 BMW 850 CSI, one of the most memorable BMW models. Most people consider the BMW 8 Series to be a failure. It was a big, heavy BMW luxury coupe that never really sold all that well. And BMW never fully replaced the 8 Series, although they supposedly planned to soon. But the 850 CSI was the shining star with its V12 and its stick shift and its BMW M car van. And I strongly suspect values of these will only continue to rise. And now it's time to give it a Doug score. Starting with the weekend categories and styling, the 8 Series was considered bloated when it came out, but as cars have gotten larger, it now seems sleek and svelte, and it gets an 8 out of 10. Acceleration, it does 0 to 60 in 5.9 seconds, giving it a 4 out of 10. Next up is handling, it's fine, but not exactly a sharp sports car designed for twisty roads. It's a big cruiser, and it gets a 5 out of 10. Cool factor is high, this is a big deal if you know what it is, and that brings it down to a 7 out of 10. As for importance, it's a special BMW, and indeed the coolest BMW of 
the 1990s, and it earns a 7 out of 10, bringing the total weekend score to 31 out of 50. Next up are the daily categories, starting with features. The 850 CSI had everything for 1995, but of course, over time, things have moved on, and now it just gets a 4 out of 10. Comfort is next, and the 850 CSI is shockingly comfortable and roomy, provided you're up front. It earns a 7 out of 10. Next up is quality, and I happen to think the interior is gorgeous. Very nice materials and very solid, much better than new BMWs, but I wouldn't necessarily want to be responsible for maintaining one of these now, 25 years after it came out, and it gets a 6 out of 10. Practicality, it has a decent trunk, but small rear seats and only two doors, giving it a 4 out of 10. Finally, there's value. This is a hard one to assign for this car, as it involves some predicting the future. These are expensive right now, but I suspect their values will increase, and I'm giving it a 7 out of 10, bringing the total daily score to 28 out of 50. Add it all up, and the total Doug score is 59 out of 100, which is decent for a car from this era. Maybe more interesting is a comparison of the 850 CSI against some similar cars, a few older BMWs and the Porsche 928 GTS. The 850 CSI beats out most of these competitors. It scores behind the E46 M3 and the 928 GTS in weekend categories, but it tops them in the daily score, which makes sense given the 8 Series Grand Touring capabilities. But the E39 M5 tops it in everything, no surprise, as it's one of the well-rounded greats.